Since the dawn of the machine age, handcrafted and handmade goods have, well, they've fallen into somewhat of a decline. Convenience has replaced craftsmanship. But in a place like Natchez, Mississippi, there are certain people here that strive for the best of both worlds. As the oldest city on the banks of the Mississippi, Natchez holds a special place for talented artisans interested in preserving and restoring features from the past. So are you ready to dive in where the river runs wide and the history runs deep? We'll start our tour at one of the oldest buildings in Natchez, King's Tavern, which happens to belong to a great friend of mine, Regina Charbonneau. So let's go check her out. You know me, I always have to carry plants wherever I go. Well, I couldn't come empty handed. Well, you know you can come here empty handed <laughs> or with gifts anytime. You know, I love having you here. Why don't we get these planted? Sounds like a plan. Well, be perfect in your little vegetable garden. I'm excited about this. Man, these beds are perfect. What do you have, 10 of them? I have 10 of them, 10 raised beds. You know, and you turn me on to raised beds. Mm. It is the best thing in the world. It's easy. And it's great. You wouldn't believe what I can produce just out of these beds. Oh, I, yes, I would. <laughs> well, of course, I guess you would. If anybody would know, you would. But the lettuce, we we're able to provide fresh lettuce for the restaurant all year round. Well, I thought so. you'd enjoy this romaine, a little broccoli there, and I think even brought you some Brussels sprouts. Thank you. You can put some of this on some of those famous flatbreads you make. I love arugula on a flatbread, and I've got a flatbread in the oven. We need to get in. Oh, good. Well, we can come back to this later. Okay. We'll get them planted before I leave. Good deal. Smells amazing. Oh, thank mm. you. You know, and it's so nice to be able to get the arugula from the garden and toss it in a little oil and put on top of any of the flatbread. Absolutely. So. Yeah, look at that. It's beautiful. Get a couple of forks for thank us here. You. Mm -mm. We'll jump right in here. Yes. So Regina, what drew you to this wonderful tavern? My husband Doug and my son Jean Luc wanted to do the rum distillery. Doug found this property and he only wanted the old store on the corner. And I fell in love with this building and almost the curse of vision. <laughs> I could see exactly what needed to be here. I wasn't really so planning, good, thank you, opening another restaurant, but I just felt this just called for something that was empty. And I just thought to do the wood-fired oven and kind of recreate a little bit of the old tavern atmosphere with the craft cocktails. Yeah, they would have cooked with an open fire. Absolutely. Right. And it would have been simple. Probably they had one entree. I wish I could get away with that every night. But, <laughs> yeah. but so I just kept it really simple. Mm. It's the flatbreads are the focused. We um, handcrafted. Handcrafted. And that's kind of, you know, what's going on. You want locally sourced. I, mm -hmm. You know, the raised beds provide this beautiful could mean lettuce more local and greens. Than that. <laughs> no, as local as it gets. And it just kind of fits into what people people are looking for and I've enjoyed it. I've just fell in love with this building. When we were restoring this building, I started figuring out how to make it a house <laughs> because well, I loved it so yeah, much. But you it's kept envisioning a, yourself living here. Yeah, but it's a three story tavern. It would be really hard yeah. to It was built live as a in. tavern. It was. Yeah. And it dates back to 1789. It's the oldest building in Natchez. You know, the ground floor is where the horses used to be. This was really the tavern right here. Mm, this upper, On the third yeah, floor right. was uh, sleeping bunks, but it's just, again, it's just a fabulous yeah. building. I love the way this back porch looks out over that marvelous mm. lawn. Thank yeah, you. it's wonderful. Yeah, I could be here all day. I'm glad yeah. you're with me. <laughs> I am too. It's so much fun. Later, we'll have to get out there and get to work and plant those vegetables. Okay, well, let's we'll see. We'll enjoy this now. Yeah, yeah. enjoy and, this mm. now. I'm putting you to work in a little mm. bit. So good. Coming up, we're checking out the rum at Charbonneau Distillery. It's absolutely an accomplishment for someone who never took a chemistry class. And later, restoring treasures from the past. So stay with us.
In addition to the tavern, Regina and her husband Doug own Charbonneau Distillery, which is conveniently located just next door. It's where they make their handcrafted award-winning rum. Suddenly I'm feeling a little thirsty. Come on in. In 1990, before children, my wife and I went to the islands and had good rum for the first time and decided that that was an interesting product and we've tracked it and collected and enjoyed it over many, many years. Always joked about having a rum distillery someday. Didn't make any sense in the 90s in San Francisco. When we lived in San Francisco, Minneapolis, New York City, we returned the Natchez in 2000 and it were right in the middle of sugarcane country and all it made sense. So right now I'm adding roughly 50 pounds of molasses. It looks end up being a five gallon bucket's worth. Our molasses is super thick. It runs about uh, 16 pounds per gallon. So it's twice as heavy as water. It's absolutely an accomplishment for someone who never took a chemistry class. I didn't know exactly what was going on. I can read about it, but I can't necessarily uh, know exactly what the, what the absolute backbone basis of it is. But we know how it works. Uh, when we did the first fermentation, we're wondering what it should and would taste like and look like, and we saw that, and we did the first distillation. We again found out what it looks like when it's happening, what it tastes like when it's coming off of the still, uh, and then eventually what it tastes like when it goes into the bottle. Uh, and then eventually, through our barrel program, we're now finding out what it tastes like when it's been in a barrel for a few months or in, coming up very soon, a uh, one-year barrel. Right now, I'm getting ready to add some water. We uh, used 120-degree water to dissolve our sugar. And the pressure nozzle uh, just helps break up all the sugar and molasses. So the process for making rum is that it's all based on sugar cane. There's two or three different ways you can use that sugar. You can either crush the cane and use free run juice, like you make wine from free run grape juice, or you can use molasses, which 90% of the rum in the world is made from molasses, which is the product left over at the end of the sugar extraction process at the sugar mill. Uh, we chose a little different route in that we use molasses from the mill, but we also use some of the raw sugar from the mill in a secret combination that allows us to get some flavor from the sugar itself as opposed to just from the end product, the molasses, which has a little more bitterness. We take our sugar and our molasses and we put it in a 300 gallon fermentation tank, add 100 degree water, mix it up very well. Uh, sugar and molasses do mix well with water. And then we add 10 ounces of yeast. So we ferment for about 48 hours, is what it takes uh, at about 100 degree temperature. The yeast does what we want it to do, and at the end of that 48 hours, we've taken a 300 gallon vat of sugar water and converted it to a six or 7% alcohol solution. At that point, we have 20 to 21 to 25 gallons of alcohol somewhere in that 300 gallon tank, and then we have to find it. We all need copper to make alcohol. Once the liquid vaporizes and turns into steam, then the molecules will bounce off of the copper and they're extracting sulfur. Everyone has it, whether you're making whiskey, vodka, rum, you've got to get the sulfur out of the process and clean up the alcohol. So the copper does that for us. And as the vapor lives its life in copper from the moment it leaves the top of the kettle, uh, it's going to be in copper and it's extraction right up to the last point when it comes off the spout to us as a liquid. Both my son and I both know how to do it. We know what we want in our bottle and I think we hit it every time. After the break, we're making a rum cocktail that would make Hemingway proud. You don't want to miss it. Boy, this looks really good, but I think it's time for a libation. Oh, Ricky, thank you. Wow, look at that. There you go. Awesome. This is so light and fresh. It's got a nice tart edge to it. I gotta have the recipe. Guys, and what I'm gonna be doing today is called the Hemingway Daiquiri. It was actually created for Ernest Hemingway in Havana, Cuba at the uh, Floridita Bar. 
Uh, the bartender found out that he was diabetic, so he came up with this alternative to a classic Cuban cocktail for him. It starts off with one and a half ounces of rum, quarter of an ounce of maraschino liqueur, three quarters of an ounce of fresh squeezed lime juice, and a half ounce of fresh grapefruit juice. Add ice to fill. Now when you're shaking a cocktail, you're actually breaking off the corners of the ice cube, so you want to actually get in there and shake it. That imparts just a ton of oxygen into it. It makes it a little bit frothy. However, when you do it, you're breaking off the corners of the ice cubes. And if you leave those sitting, it'll actually dilute the cocktail. So I'd take a cone strainer and get rid of those. Garnish with a maraschino cherry. Damning the daiquiri. Coming up next, preserving the past and beautifying the future by restoring old homes to their former glory. From pre-Civil War dream home to ladies college to now a beautifully restored National Historic Landmark, Stanton Hall has had an interesting and long history. Now renovating a historic home is no easy task. Just ask Bridget Green and Duncan Morgan, Natchez locals who share a passion for preserving the past. I am president of the Pilgrimage Garden Club, which owns Stanton Hall and Longwood. We are on the grounds of Stanton Hall right now, and both properties are national landmarks. There are 13 national landmark properties in Natchez. We also have over 1,200 houses or buildings that are on the historic national registry, which makes Natchez very unique. Most of our community is involved in restoration and preservation because there are so many of these beautiful buildings in our community. My philosophy has always been when we finish something to make it look like we've never been there, to try to replicate exactly like it was, you know, when it was, when it was built originally, including using the same mortar and the techniques. And much of what you see around Natchez, the homes, the gardens, the brick walks, and elaborate gardens and all were either added or they had to be taken up and restored. And also, it's been a busy life. Restoring these homes is totally a great amount of energy, but it's very rewarding, and it is something that gets in your blood. Uh, my husband and I have now restored four homes here in Natchez, and we're probably not at the, the end of our line either, but it's just, something that is, you give back to the community and restoring these homes is something that has to be done for history. It's home. I am old Natchez. I've never wanted to live anywhere else. I am very concerned about the preservation and of the city itself. And it's, Natchez is coming into the 20th century. And I say 20th deliberately. So that's a good thing. Fortunately, we had an influx of people from California or Texas or some with money, with real money who came in and bought some of these houses and restored them and made them ready to stand for another 100 years. But to me, Natchez is home. 
And I can't judge by anywhere else because this has been home all my life. I've never wanted to, and I never lived anywhere where I could compare. So I am old Natchez. Natchez is an old town. We're both unique, and I guess we're compatible. Next on Garden Style, learning the ins and outs of antique furniture restoration. Large trees produce the wood from which beautiful furniture is made. Period appropriate pieces, particularly original ones, set the ambience for visitors to truly experience what life might have been like way back then. Um, if I have a lot of reverence for this furniture, um, I don't compromise on the work that I do. I see myself as a steward for our American decorative arts history, and so I don't want to do things that are irreversible or devalue a piece or, or you know, uh, compromise its integrity in any way. Well, all of us who have inherited things and love furniture have pieces of furniture that need some work done on them. A lot of people want to buy their furniture and see it before any work's done on it. Because sometimes you will buy something that's in beautiful shape and ready to put in the house and then you get it in there and an expert looks at it and you find out that half of it's replaced. Well, you, if you see it before any restoration work's done on it, you can be confident that you're buying an, an original, complete piece of antique furniture. And well, so, I fit in this category yeah. because I found a piece of furniture that I don't know much about. I loved its form and it hadn't been messed with too much and I want you to take a look at it and see what you can do. Well, I'd be glad to. I'd love yeah. to see new things. <laughs> well, why don't we take a look at it? We, it limped in, so but it does need some help. Okay, let's <laughs> take a look. Okay, what do we have here? Well, here's the patient. You know, it's, uh, it needs, needs some help. It, it may be broken, but this is actually where this foot was created by gluing several pieces of wood together oh, to see. create enough mass, mass to get the carving. Mm. The glue joint failed and it, it just fell off. off. So you think you can breathe breathe new life into oh, it? Oh I think I think we can we can fix that gimpy foot without any problem. Okay, I'm tired of her limping yeah. around the house. It's sort of a challenge. It's a Great, great depth of satisfaction in it, you know. I have friends that are CPAs that go, boy, I sure would like to do what you do. You know, I get it done at the end of the day, and all I have to look forward to is closing my eyes and seeing rows of numbers going on the inside of my eyelids, where I get to look at something, a beautiful, functional piece of furniture, whether you sit on it or look at it or put things in it or put things on it. So you get that gratification, and that, that rocks me along pretty good. Want to learn more? Visit pallensmith.com for delicious recipes, garden tips, blog posts, and our online store. I hope you've enjoyed our little peek into this beautiful historic city that's called Natchez, Mississippi. I don't know about you, but I applaud their efforts in celebrating handcrafted and local. Hey, I think I can hear Regina's fritters calling my name. Mm-mm. Well, until next time, I'm Alan Smith. <laughs>